The case against Eric Chauvin lands loudly, guilty on all counts, but while it's a moment, is it a movement? And Michigan's redistricting committee is at work on a profoundly important endeavor, drawing up the state's electoral districts, but can they possibly make everyone happy? Today is Sunday, April 25th, 2021, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, and welcome to Flashpoint. It's good to have you with us. We come to you after a very dramatic week in America. Yes, the fight against COVID continues as our endless background loop. In fact, we're reaching that worrisome point where vaccine demand now appears to be falling well behind vaccine supply. And clearly public health experts have their hands full fighting the hesitancy that is clearly pretty strong among many right now. But we found our attention fixed squarely this past week on Minneapolis as the jury made rather quick order of their task in convicting former police officer Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd. As that happened, we were presented with fresh attention grabbing cases of people dying in conflict involving police. Interestingly, the chief reaction across the country as the verdicts were read seemed to be one of relief rather than celebration. As the producer of this program, Olive Hathakanavala noted, it was like seeing a scan that shows you're still riddled with cancer, but at least it hasn't grown since last time. There is work to do because yes, there is a difference between a moment and a movement. And we're gonna talk about that this morning. We're also gonna talk about the push in Lansing as Republicans try what we've seen tried in a number of other states now on changing state election laws. Is it ensuring an election is safe or is it ensuring an election has fewer voters taking part? And speaking of elections, a new poll shows 75% of Michiganders have not heard of the Michigan Redistricting Commission. That's interesting because Michiganders voted for it and they are at work right now to carve up our voting districts in a fairer way. But is that possible? It's all today on Flashpoint. We've got quite a bit of catching up to do this morning. A number of issues swirling that we have backburnered a bit as we've been in the middle of this spring surge in coronavirus cases. Let's start, though, with how we move forward as a nation from the Derek Chauvin trial. Good to have with us this morning Portia Roberson, CEO of Focus Hope. Nolan Finley is here from the Detroit News. Sandy Barua back on board, the head of the Detroit Regional Chamber. And Stephen Henderson, the host of Detroit Today on WDET. Uh, Stephen, let me start with you. I mentioned that uh, off the top that it seemed more relief than anything else this week. And yet, Yet other cases were surfacing in real time. Really curious about what your takeaway was from the week. Well, so, I mean, of course, uh, Derek Chauvin uh, murdered George Floyd and should have been held responsible for that by the law. And we saw uh, a jury do that in Minneapolis. And, and that is uh, a step in the right direction, uh, given how often we don't see uh, police officers held accountable for murder. And they murder citizens quite a bit. They murder black citizens at disproportionate rates. Uh, but I keep coming back to uh, the statement that the Minneapolis Police Department put out the night that, uh, that George Floyd was killed. Uh, and what they said was that uh, a suspect had died of a, quote, medical incident. Um, uh, while he was being arrested. That says everything about what this problem is. This is not about rogue cops. This is not about a group of bad cops. This is about a system that um, is designed and is, is propelled in the direction of uh, injustice and lying and cover-up uh, on behalf of its officers. Uh, and, and so I think the question for black America really uh, is becoming, you know, at what point uh, should we stop even engaging with law enforcement in this country because it's dangerous, uh, it doesn't protect us from the crime that disproportionately affects our communities, and uh, it, it threatens our lives. It, and the question for the rest of America is, what are you willing to do to change policing, to fundamentally change policing in a way uh, that would not have these things happen uh, and not institutionalize the the idea that this is okay. That this it's, is a, it's, it's a it's it's a 
terribly heavy question, Stephen. Uh, Portia, uh, we, we've, we see then, I, I had uh, Rashida Tlaib on the program last week, and she, of course, tweeted out that it's time to get rid of policing and get rid of incarceration. You, you drill down and you, feel, you realize that's not exactly uh, what she means uh, in a total way. But the rhetoric is so heated right now. To see a congresswoman uh, at such odds with her home district's police chief, I, I, I am wondering how we, how we kind of create the kind of change Stephen is hoping for. Well, but I can't disagree with, with Congresswoman Tlaib. I mean, the reality of it is if we expect the system as it is now to be revamped in the structure that it currently is into something new, I think we're, we're sorely mistaken that that's going to happen. I think there's no question that we're going to have to dismantle the system as it stands today. And, you know, one of the things that stood out to me, actually kind of two of the things that stood out to me is as the conviction was coming down against Derek Chauvin, there is revelation, more revelation about past incidents that he's had that because we did not have a video, no one chose to charge him. And that speaks yeah. volumes to that cover-up mentality. And then, as, as Stephen mentioned, you know, the engagement of Black people in calling the police. I mean, the the at least the early story is that the young woman who was shot in Columbus, and I know there's a lot of controversy around whether that shooting was justified, but the reality, or at least what we're hearing at least initially, is that she was the one who called the police. And so you have to wonder whether or not you are going to call the police when you're engaged or when you're where you're feeling at threat because you know that it could go terribly wrong and you could end up dead on the sidewalk. And so I really do think we're going to have to sort of blow up the criminal justice system and how law enforcement operates now and rebuild it because I don't think it can be transformed from the inside or transformed from its current state into what we all are looking for, which is a, mm. a, a law enforcement um, and criminal justice system that all of us can rely upon. Uh, Sandy, I, 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 I guess I see in this uh, the politicization that seems so inescapable about everything else in life uh, right now, including coronavirus. But I, there was a poll this week that showed that a lot of Republicans uh, didn't think that Derek Chauvin should be found uh, should be found guilty. I, I, are the politics just uh, is it impossible to wash those out of what we're watching when we're talking about evidence in a trial? Yeah, I mean, what we need as a nation desperately is a really open, honest, candid conversation about where we are in policing in this country. Because, you know, we I think we all have to understand that multiple things can be true at the same time. Clearly, the data shows that people of color, especially black Americans, are getting arrested more frequently uh, in similar situations where white Americans are not. There are obviously, you know, there's a big disparity in terms of, you know, uh, police involved uh, shootings uh, against black Americans. We saw the videotape of George Floyd being murdered on the street of Minneapolis. But also we have to understand that police are being asked to do so much more in today's society than they did, you know, back in, you know, the Andy Griffith days, right? You know, social counselors and things like that. And they're not equipped to do that. And we haven't really given our police uh, and our law enforcement community the resources that they need to do that. I mean, we've been paying them less. We've been providing them fewer resources. I mean, you know, there is uh, a challenge here for all of us to come together and say, hey, we have a problem. Let's admit that we have a problem. Let's fix it. But let's ensure that the people that who are who we rely on, you know, for for our safety and security uh, have the resources the training that they need to actually execute the mission that they've been given, which is different today than it was a generation ago. Uh, uh, Nolan, it does, uh, when we talk resources, that means money. I heard the uh, the head of the Michigan Police Chiefs Association this week say that uh, right now Michigan spends about the equivalent of $120 or so per police officer on training every year. That's most businesses uh, spend a lot more money on training their employees every year than 120 bucks, especially for something as important as policing. Yeah, and I would agree with Sandy. We're putting these people in a position to deal with all of the problems in society that we haven't dealt with. And Robert Bob, the former um, emergency manager of Detroit Public Schools, wrote a piece for us this past week yeah. talking about the need to approach this issue in a holistic way. It's not just about the police. It's about the situations that are creating uh, the that are leading to the violence 
in our society and the desperation in our society. And certainly race is a huge factor, but it's not just a racial issue. Half the people who get shot in this country are white people. I do agree with Portia that we've got to look at how we're policing. And, you know, I think we have to stop and ask ourselves, and, you know, a lot of departments no longer do high-speed chases because they became too dangerous. Um, yeah, yeah. How can we de defuse these encounters? Is it okay sometime to walk away? Should we be emphasizing that lethal force is an absolutely last resort? Uh, and routine traffic stops. You know, I went to Italy, came back home. There were $500 worth of camera tickets in my mailbox. I never got pulled over. We have the technology to avoid these routine traffic stops that often are used as an excuse to pull somebody over or lead to these uh, uh, explosive events occurring uh, when it wasn't anticipated. Uh, I, I'm sure it was just but, a David, language barrier and not your horrendous driving skills. Yes, I'm sorry, right, Portia, did right. you want to jump in? No, well, but I was just going to point out that one of the things we have to think about, too, is that when these, the, these police brutality cases or these um, um, murders happen and the payout from the city becomes, I think in Chauvin's case, it was $27 million. So you want to talk about you know, the amount of money we spend on police training, that comes out of a general fund. And so it's a it's an ongoing perpetuating cycle. You yeah. remove more money from the general fund, so there's less money for the city to provide social services. There's less money for the city to provide good schools. There's less money for after-school activities. And so, you know, it also engages the idea that, you know, when we see these payouts, we sort of, oh, the family deserved that which they did, but remember that it's coming from the very people who probably need that money more so in terms of all the other services we could be providing as a government in order to make sure that our citizens are safe, not only because we train more police officers and train them much better, but that we also provide other activities, health counseling that we got rid of under um, a former governor that we just destroyed. And so we ended up using the criminal justice system as a housing technique for people who were mentally ill. And that's not going to work. And we know that over and over and over again, it's not going to work. And that's why I maintain that we're not going to be able to just sort of revamp this system. We've got to blow it up and start again and figure out how it works going forward. Uh, and Devin, if I could just add, um, there, in these situations, there's a lot of fear on both sides of the of the badge, and I think we have to work to yeah, take no, the fear. There's out not of always that. fear. With, no, no, when you get stopped, your fear is going to be what extremely is the different than what Stephen's fear is going to be, and we see that time and time again. I and see. I, white men challenging officers, telling them, I'm, I'm not, not getting saying, out the car, I'm not, saying, I'm not doing any of and that. I'm not saying that, Portia, but I'm saying that in these situations, both the people who get, or are getting stopped and the police officer are in a very fearful, un unpredictable uh, Why, are, Why are they so afraid of us, though? What is it about decisions. me that makes people them so make afraid? decisions when they're afraid. And Why I think we've got to figure out how to take uh, uh, Hang on, gang, gang, gang it's, it's starting to sound like mud, everybody talking over each other. Uh, Stephen, yes, jump yes. in there one at a time, if we could. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, got to ask, and this gets to the systemic problem, why are the police afraid of black people uh, in a way that they are not afraid of white people? Why are they afraid of black people who they have down on the ground uh, with their knee on their neck and stay there for nine minutes? That, that's not fear. Uh, that's hatred. That's bigotry. It's mm. bias. And you have to address it that way, I think, before you can even talk about uh, reform uh, of police. We have, we have a problem in the culture that assigns uh, uh, assigns, uh, assigns uh, uh, absolute maliciousness to black skin, and and that that's a that's what the police are responding to. I think that's true in a lot of cases. Some cases, I don't think in every case, that's what's motivating here. I think there are you there are these in these situations. People are afraid. I mean, police officers are human beings. Whether that person is black or white, I think there's there's fear involved, and I think we have to take now that fearful uh, part of these these encounters. Let me let me let Sandy jump in before we get to the break. Go ahead, Sandy. So under the you know, under the headline, you know, multiple things can be true at the same time. So first of all, you know, Nolan and I kind of come for, come into this conversation from a position of privilege. Despite the number of times that Nolan and I may have been pulled over, you know, I've never been accused of driving a car that's not mine. I've never felt you know any fear that my life was going to be in danger. And you know, and not all segments of society can say that. And I just want to acknowledge that you know there's a, there's a privilege here. But also to to Porsche's point, I mean, you do see different interactions, you know, with 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 whites versus blacks. I mean. 
mean, as Portia said, you see those you know challenges being made by white people, and they're treated very differently. But again, you know, 2019 was also the year that had the most law enforcement officers killed in this country. So you know, yeah. you know that you know, I don't think we can ignore that fact either. So again, multiple things can be. We uh, did not get to the other topics, but there was no way that I was going to stop you guys. I really appreciate the very thoughtful conversation. Thanks, gang. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a quick break. We'll back, be back with more. We're going to talk about the redistricting effort in Michigan. So critical. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. From where I'm sitting, looks like you need floors that can handle pets. Are you seeing this? Well, you have to admire his work ethic. Anyway, go to Carpet One for a great deal on scratch-resistant floors. Here to floor you. Independent Carpet One Flooring Home. And right now, it's our Claws and Paws flooring sale. Save up to $1,000 and get special financing. Save big. Shop small at Independent Carpet One. There's so much awesome stuff to stream nowadays. But the cost of it all can really add up. That's why Xfinity helps you save. Sign up for internet and get a free Flex 4K streaming box. Enjoy access to your favorite apps, even Disney+. Plus. Entertainment that starts at free. Can your internet do that? Oh boy, we're gonna need bigger bolt. Get started with Xfinity Internet now with double the speed included. Plus, add a Flex 4K streaming box for free. Click, call, or visit a store today. For 81 years, we've been here for Michigan. From day one to year 100 committed to the communities we call home because we're here for it all and always will be. Confidence comes with every card. We're here for you. With more ways to access the care you need from the doctors you trust. We're here for it all and always will be. Confidence comes with every card. Monday at 5. Nothing was left for them and they were so young. Her family killed hit by a drunk driver, and that grief is taking her all the way to Washington, D.C. Their crash changed everything. It is because of your family. I couldn't walk away from that. In memory of the one she loved. Sometimes we don't choose our battles, they choose us. Hear her story and her mission. How she hopes to stop another drunk driver from devastating another family. Monday at 5 on 4. Welcome back. As I mentioned, there is some very critical work going on will impact all of us in Michigan for years to come. It's the work of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. 13 people charged with drawing up our congressional legislative districts. Chances are we're going to lose a seat in Congress, which makes the exercise even more charged. Very happy to have with us this morning three members of the commission. Let's bring in Brittany Kellum, one of the four Democratic members. Douglas Clark is one of the four Republicans on the commission. There are also five independents and Rebecca Zetla is uh, one of them. Rebecca, let me start with you. I'll start independent. I'll start with an independent in the middle. Uh, this is really you. You this week, you all had to ask the court for more time uh, because this is all written into law, your deadlines. But you need more time because the census needs more time, correct? Yes. Um, unfortunately, the Census Bureau has been delayed in their work, so they are not planning on producing census results until September 30th, which is several months after their typical deadline. Um, so as a result of that, we're going to be asking the Michigan Supreme Court to provide us with a little bit more time so that we can complete our maps in a timely process. How much is uh, what do you suppose that does to your timeline? Well, our, um, and that's under a the tough Constitution, question because you've never done this before, right? Yeah. <laughs> so under the Constitution, um, we had to have our maps done by November 1st, and right. we had to have a 45-day public comment before that. Um, so ideally, we would have had to have had the census data by September 30th. So we're now, or September 17th. So we're now not getting it till September 30th. So if we get it on September 30th, we can rush really quickly and get that 45-day comment period in, and maybe have an additional 60 days to complete it. Um, uh, but uh, Brit let me let me bring in Brittany here. Brittany, I mentioned at the top of the program, 75% of Michiganders say they they haven't heard of this commission, and yet they voted to create the, uh, the panel on which you serve. Uh, what do you do? You think people understand what's going on and how important it is to all of us in our lives? 
So I think there's a bright spot there. We have an opportunity to really engage in a way that brings understanding, that opens not only education in terms of what the commission is, but our purpose and our intention. And also um, with our public comments, public hearings, we're really being intentional and purposeful about how we get the public involved. So we're really looking forward to interacting in a way that makes sure folks feel empowered and understand, particularly with things like this, we get to talk with you and folks get to understand a little bit about what we're doing. And so I think that 75% is, you know, relative because it just suggests that we are in fact charged with the right thing, which is being, you know, everyday citizens and interacting with the folks that need to know more as they should, because we need them in order to do this remapping. We need to know who's out there and what they're up to and how they live and where they live and what matters to them. Well, in fact, I want to let you each weigh in on what you think is your guiding principle here. Uh, Doug, the, uh, it's interesting. I, I think everybody has pointed out that they think that this process needs to be, that our districts need to be drawn more fairly. And I imagine that's where the, that's where the agreement ends because everybody's got a different idea of what fair is. What does fair mean to you in trying to draw this up? Well, uh, fair means to me that um, that we number one follow the Constitution. The Constitution has identified seven different aspects that we've got to follow. Um, number number one, I'll list a couple of them. Number one was um, that uh, each of the districts has to be equal population, and there's a variance that we have here. I believe it's about one percent on the congressional districts and it's around 5% on the state legislature and the state uh, Senate districts. And um, the, the other important thing is that we, we incorporate in our work um, the wishes of the com different communities of interest throughout the state. Um, and those are still being identified. There is no list of them. Yeah. Uh, and we rely on public comment to, to understand it more throughout the state. Uh, Rebecca, so I would say those are the... Let me let Rebecca weigh in on the same question. How do, what does fairness look like here? It's not as simple as a grid, of course. No, it, it's not a simple question. And obviously, people are going to have different interpretations. I think the constitutional requirements are what's going to guide us. And I think the most important principle for this new committee is for us to weigh in public opinion. That's something that's never happened before. I think it's incredibly exciting that citizens can comment and provide feedback on the maps. And to me, that's going to define what it means to be fair. The people being ha people having an opportunity to have a say in the matter is what's going to be fair. And Brittany, you too, uh, especially with an eye toward if we end up losing a seat, um, then the, the, the chairs really get uh, shuffled in a new way. Yeah, and just to follow up with what Rebecca said, I think um, the most important part that I really enjoy about our process is that even when we come up with one plan, you know, for each district, when we're developing that, there is a second round of public hearings where there's this constant interaction back and forth. So while you highlight something that is very important to consider and definitely in our purview, um, this kind of symbiotic relationship, again, that we're urgently trying to develop will be crucial. So it is exciting and hopeful to keep continuing to interact with the community and get this done. That would be, that sounds like the exciting part of this. Uh, uh, Douglas, I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious though. So by, de by definition, you all are not political professionals. Uh, this job was intended to go to Michigan voters. That was your qualification uh, to be a part of this. Tell me a little bit about the way that the relationships have developed so far and the way that you feel uh, the, the cooperation has gone on with, as I mentioned, the breakdown of the way that this commission is put together. That's a great question. Uh, I, I am very, very pleased about the relationship among the 13 commissioners. That's We've great. developed a culture um, where we're nonpartisan, all of us. I mean, I don't think I could even list the four Democrats on, on, the, uh, on the commission. I, we just don't pay attention to that. And we're all focused toward uh, getting a lot of public comment and a lot of public input and um, doing this the right way. We've hired uh, some consultants to help us. We've hired a, in, or in the process of getting a purchase order done for the for a voting rights analyst, uh, voting rights attorney that will assist us in um, making sure we follow the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and any subsequent litigation that's taken place relative to that. Um, 
So he'll he'll guide us and advise us on that to make sure we don't step out of bounds on that. Well, I know you all are basically, you're pioneers, and you're uh, kind of uh, inventing this uh, this process as you go. I wish you all the best of luck on it. I so appreciate the reflections and the thoughts on how it's going so far, and I, uh, I hope that we can talk to you again in the future here as it makes its way down this terribly important road. Thanks, gang, for being here. Thank, Thank you so much for having much. us. You're very welcome. We'll take a quick break and wrap things up for Flashpoint right after this on Local 4. When you deposit on DraftKings Sportsbook, you can get a bonus up to $1,000. But what are you going to do with all that cash? Throw it on a lock? How about a five-team parlay? You hit it, you are swimming in moolah. Signing up is simple. And getting a deposit bonus up to $1,000 makes it even sweeter. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Get your bonus and make it rain. This is your moment. Your I can see the doctors I know moment. Your I've got options I can trust moment. Your I get to choose moment. This is your moment to get health care coverage with access to a large nationwide network. With AmBetter, you have access to the doctors you need when you need them right in your area. Get started at enrollambetter.com or call 855-680-3355. This is not just a mask. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to togetherness and protection for those we love. So until we all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, stay careful, mask up and social distance. Spread hope, not COVID. Once you've been fully vaccinated, you join a club of people who can start doing more stuff safely again. The CDC says it's safe to gather indoors with other vaccinated people without a mask or with low risk unvaccinated people from one other household. Vaccinated people should still wear a mask in public and stay away from crowds. The same common sense stuff we will all be doing for a while. But once you're vaccinated, you can take those first steps back to normal. Get the facts about the vaccine. Every intention, I promise, of getting to the Republican package of bills on changing voting laws in Michigan. But as always, we've run out of time. So for next time, we'll do that. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the Press is next. Have a great week. See you next time on Flashpoint.